Let us pray. Jesus, our master, meet us while we walk in the way and long to reach the better country so that following your light, we may keep the path of righteousness and not wander into the darkness of this world's night while you, the way, the truth, the life, guide us. Amen. Our reading, the final one in the book of Daniel, is the final chapter, Daniel chapter 12. Dreams and visions have dominated this last half of the book, and yes, they are terrible. They are terrifying, and Daniel is frightened. It is the normative and appropriate response to these revelations. But now in this last chapter, some additional information comes to him and more help and interpretation, but words of comfort. And these are the words that are spoken by the angel on behalf of God to Daniel, now an old man, a prophet at the end of his years. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of the nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. And you, Daniel, roll up the seal of the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Many will go here and there to increase knowledge. Then I, Daniel, looked. And there before me stood two others, one on this bank of the river and one on the opposite bank. One of them said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river, how long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled? The man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river hand toward lifted heaven. his And I heard him swear by him who lives forever, saying, it will be for a time, times, and half a time. When the power of the holy people has finally been broken, all these things will be completed. I heard, but I did not understand. So I asked, my Lord, what will be the outcome of all this? Sealed until the time of the end. Many will be purified, made spotless, and refined. But the wicked will continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. From the time that the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that causes desolation is set up, there'll be 1,290 days. Blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end of 1,335 days. As for you, go your way till the end. You will rest, and then at the end of your days, you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance. This is the word of the Lord. Daniel has served his generation well. Like Joseph before him and Esther after him, Daniel had served kings, foreign kings, in foreign places, pagan places, capitals of paganism, Thebes, Babylon, Susa. They did not choose their place nor their time, nor do we. Timing belongs to God, who sets them, us, in our generations. They chose faithfulness. It required of them wisdom, courage, and grace, and God gave it. They knew that in order to serve their God, they would need to serve the king of God's choosing in their own generations, Disappointing as that might be, disappointing as those kings are, barbaric, brutal, unbelieving though they be. We know this now from our time spent with Daniel. In order to serve our God in our generation, in our place, we will need to serve the unbelieving kings about us, however petty, however pagan. The people of God know that the love of God is connected with love of neighbor. 
And that service toward God, therefore, is connected with service toward neighbor. Yes, yes, I understand it. I have that yearning in me. I would rather sing and rule and celebrate victories with a king like David. Wouldn't that be glorious? Well, more so at least than Nebuchadnezzar or Belshazzar or Darius. Good grief. But more than anything else, we want to serve our great king. And in order to do that, we serve the kings of our generation. Kings that in God's providence he has raised up and for whose sake he has appointed us to be useful. Now, Daniel's service, or at least the stories of it, are now at an end. These are his retirement years. God is now directing Daniel's attention, not to what's next, but to what's last. And the vehicles for these revelations are no longer the challenges and dreams and visions of others, but his own. God is now provoking Daniel to think past the present, even past the patterns of the past and present. To the distant future, the Bible says, the time of the end, it names it. With Daniel in these last six of 12 chapters, we look past this particular king and kingdom which rose and fell, Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians, Darius and the Persians. We even look past that kings and kingdom all in their time rise and fall, Babylonians, Persians, Greeks, Romans, Americans, whatever comes next, and on and on and on. For now we see in focus that kings and kingdoms all pass away, all, all but one, the coming, final, everlasting king and his kingdom. Daniel himself is now being served in these revelations. God has sent him an interpreter, Gabriel, the angel. Daniel has been given the gift of interpreting dreams, the dreams of others apparently, but not his own. And this Daniel now becomes not only the recorder of the visions and their interpretations, but he has become our model on how to receive these revelations. With fear and trembling, with humility and trust, silence and sustained prayer and reflection, we neither ignore these revelations nor do we play with them, for they are terrible. The visions show the world's violence, as great as it is, will not be able to stand against the violence of heaven. Can you think of a more horrible thought? Daniel will suffer for learning this. He may not have ever recovered from these visions and dreams. So words of com comfort often accompany the angelic interpretations so that Daniel will survive the hearing and seeing of them. What is it that he saw? First, he saw the great exchange, the replacement strategy of our great God, this replacing that, this for that. The multi-metal man of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, you remember him, representing Babylon and Persia and Greece and Rome as the metals become inferior and you go down the length of the human body and all the latter kingdoms and thus all kingdoms, probably our own, are included. The metal man was smashed by a rock that rolled over it, pulverizing it. and The powders of it blew away with the wind. It was no more. This rock, we are told carefully, was cut out of a mountain, not by human hands. And only the rock will endure. The rock of ages is the replacement for the kingdoms of history. God will replace the kingdoms of this world with one of his own making, of his own hands, with his own king to rule over it, the time of human self-governance will end. It will be found wanting and be replaced. That which will be last will last and will be established by God. 
not made with human hands. And we see, it seems like a contradiction at first, the great change, not the great exchange only, but the great change. <coughs> Daniel saw the great placement strategy of God in addition to the replacement strategy. This comes from that. The people of God continue. We are not exchanged. We are changed. Our faithful God does not replace us or discard us at the end, but transforms us throughout and all that is around us. Even, maybe even especially, from our defeats, God creates victories. Just as from Good Friday comes Easter and the resurrection from death. The establishment of the kingdom of God at the end of time is not its beginning, but the completion of its construction. It was begun in Christ, who is its architect and builder. He has been building the kingdom all along, right here, right now. He has been ruling it in and through his people all along. People like Daniel and his three friends, people like, well, like you and me. Now this has spawned the great debate. The revelations of the end. Is this about exchange, this for that? One thing gone, another thing replacing it? Or is this about change, this being transformed into what it was not? Do they show us continuity or discontinuity? When, for example, the scriptures speak of a new heavens and a new earth, do they speak of the replacement of the old heavens and old earth? Or a transformation of the whole earth? old heavens and earth. We take as our model what the apostle tells us in his letter to the Corinthians. If anyone is in Christ, that one is a new creation. The old is past and gone. Behold, the new is come. It is an announcement of discontinuity. Yet we continue. Daniel, I think, speaks of both. From the scriptures, this is my interpretation. I offer it to you. The weight is on one side, I think. God is at work redeeming his creation, not replacing it. God is transforming us and all about us, forgiving our sins, showing us mercy, amending our lives. God created all and declared it all to be good at its beginning. And he has not changed his mind about it. In spite of all of our rebellions, this is his good creation. And he will not abandon his mission in it. He has not quit on it. He has not grown tired of it. Nor will he. Not our faithful God. So what ought we to think and do? Well, first, human activity will have its day of judgment. That evil will come to an end. He will break it. It will be no more. And humanity will have its day of salvation. His creation continues, transformed and redeemed. We shall be forevermore. Both are of God, judgment and salvation. And the people of God, like Daniel, are called and commissioned to be and build this kingdom of God in our own generations. Christ has established it. God will complete it. We labor in it as God works it in us. There's a biblical phrase for all this, redeeming the time. What do we do in the meantime of the world's evil and God's great kingdom finally to come? Well, first we're to be useful with the time we have. Even though eternity does not depend on us, yet we value today and make the most of it. And we aim our lives toward the end. That's our second move. Pointing our lives in the direction of our destination. Building what God promised would withstand time. Building now what will be at the end. Practicing now what we will be then. We are fully engaged in our day fully expecting another day. No passive waiting, 
no joy in the world's demise. Jerome is one of my favorite scholars, a Latin scholar, always busy at work. It's in a cave, a cavern, next to the place of nativity in Bethlehem. He'll expend most of his lives and the abilities that God has given him in translating the Bible and doing the work of building up the saints in his generation. And, and in his writings, oh, James, as well as anyone, the brutality of the empire directed against the people of faith. Jerome, when he hears of the sack of Rome, writes in a letter, a terrible rumor has reached me from the West telling me of Rome besieged, bought for gold, besieged again, life and property forfeited, perishing together. My voice falters, sobs stifle the words I dictate, for she is captive the city that enthralled the world. The world and its great cities will finally fail for their rebellions against God, but not for our laziness. So why our efforts if God in the end and at the beginning and throughout does all things? What reward is for this labor? Is there some? Yes. For there will be salvation. We witness to the truth in this in-between time. We witness to repentance, that turning toward God, which God has appointed as a way of us receiving the salvation he freely offers. And we witness to the truth of judgment, not just turning toward God, but standing before God. We restrain evil. The book of Daniel shows us culture without God, fiery furnaces and deadly dens. Nations at their best do not establish order. Nations at their best merely restrain disorder, the bent of the human heart and society. And are you prepared to hear it? We take the brunt of evil on behalf of a world that does not know its Savior, in solidarity with a Savior that took all the world's sins upon himself. Martyrs matter for the sake of God, for the sake of the faithful, for the sake of their murderers. Martyrs matter. Babylon is falling. Jerusalem is rising. On the last day, Jerusalem will descend. We are building the kingdom of God within the kingdom of man, as God is building the kingdom of God within our humanity and in the human heart. On this he will not quit, nor will he fail nor therefore are we permitted to quit. God will accomplish his purposes in us all and through us all. In this then, we will not fail. Daniel's perseverance and patience and yes, power in his generation are models for us. And yes, yes, to be clear, the kingdom of God is the kingdom of God. God is its builder. The kingdom of God comes from outside history but it has come in Christ. And so we expend our lives within it, building it. We labor and labor and labor and seemingly too often have so very little to show for it. Two steps forward, one step back in our generation, two steps back in our generation. And when we are done with our labors and God is done with his labor in us, then and only then, the new Jerusalem descends from heaven not made with human hands, and descends to us, an inheritance we did not earn. Listen to the final words again of the angel to our hero Daniel. Words given an old man after his labors were complete. As for you, go your way to the end. You will rest. Then at the end of the days you will rise 
rise to receive your given inheritance. What comes last after our labors are completed, after our lives have been expended within the kingdoms of our generation, serving the kings of our time and place, rest, then rising, then receiving. Then we will witness in history at its end what Daniel saw in visions. The kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. That world without end. Amen and amen. Let us pray. O oh Lord, we wake from this dream in the sight of this vision, terrible as it is, with fear and trembling, humility and trust, silence and sustained prayer and thought. Set us in our generation as your workers, building your kingdom among the present kingdoms, serving the only great king among the kings of our day. And at the end, grant us rest, raise us up, and let us receive our allotted inheritance. Like Daniel, like Jesus, in whose name we pray, in whose kingdom we labor, and in whose coming we yearn. Amen.